Welcome to Being Humankind, with your hosts Brian, Mike, and Neely. We explore what it means to be human in a time of disconnection. What is a dream that you had that you have never forgotten? And what meaning did it have for you at the time? And how has that meaning changed? Dream that I've had that I've never forgotten. It wasn't a dream, but it was a nighttime experience. Actually two. The first, when I was about 16-ish, I was working part-time in a restaurant. I was, when was, when was part-time, I was in high school. And I was living at home, of course, and 16. So when you, when you mentioned 16 year old son, Neely, I immediately thought back to my relationship with my mom at 16. <laughs> so I do understand that. And I don't remember the specifics of what I was going through at that age. It was probably some 16 year old crisis. But I remember coming home and I fell asleep crying. I woke up crying. I fell asleep crying. I woke up crying. And then throughout the night, at some point I woke and I remember saying to myself, I don't know why I'm going through this, but I'm going through it for a reason. And somehow this experience is going to help me at some point in my life. And I often think about that 16 year old young man and I send him energy in this moment and other moments prior to this moment to say it's going to be okay, it turns out all right. And the funny part is that in that moment at 16, a sense of overwhelming calm came to me that in fact, everything was going to be okay. And so that one wasn't a dream, but that was a night, I refer to it as a nighttime experience. And I think about that in relation to the concept of time from Michael Talbot's holographic universe. He talks about time and this idea that we're living in a hologram and things and time, they don't happen from a linear perspective, but they happen simultaneously and that there are multiple timelines. And I often imagine that the, the, the sense of calm that I received at that point at the age of 16 was coming from subsequent or other points in time feeding back to that moment to inform me to stay the course and continue to move forward irrespective of the stumbling blocks that I encountered along the way. That was the first time. The second time was definitely a dream experience. I don't call it a dream, I call it a nighttime experience, but it was very clear. It was Tuesday, 18 August, 2009. It was the night I was raised as a master mason. I had gone to bed that night and I had this gentleman came to me. He was wearing a black suit a crisp white shirt and a black tie. I don't recall what he looked like, but I do remember the crispness of his shirt, the black suit, the black suit and the black tie. And he asks me, he says, you know, have you figured out what Freemasonry is yet? And I gave my explanation that uh, it was, you know, imbued with principles that are universal, that as humans are an extension of the creative force or God, that those of us who choose to walk this path have a responsibility to be an exponent of these universal principles in the world to then by virtue of our thinking and our actions and indeed thought, word and deed, thought words and deed, bring others to light, if you will. And I remember him saying to me, good, let's talk again sometime. I've had other experiences of that, but those are the two that stick out in my mind in this moment. That's 16 and then 18 August, 2009, when I was raised. How many times have you figured it out since then? <laughs> Let's just say over the years, is that 12 years now this year? 
Yeah, 12 years. Of just over the years, the more I study, the more I just contemplate, the more I come to realize Freemason is bigger than any one person or any lodge or any jurisdiction. Heck, for that matter, any country. And it being a repository, we have to treat it as a sacred thing and revere it and let it be here for successive generations. However, nature, however nature chooses to have that then be manifested because it may, as it is currently presented, it may not be in its current form in successive generations. We have to be okay with that because in truth, we're but, we're but placeholders in history, placeholders in time of this tradition. And we have a responsibility to any tradition we choose to ally ourselves with to recognize that we are placeholders. We are keepers of that flame, if you will. And in being a keeper of the flame, we have a responsibility to make sure that it's not extinguished. And the way we do that is to you know, subdue our passions, remove our ego, understand that we're in the universe and allow the highest and the best that that, whichever institution, be it Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry, uh, Bota, whatever, all of them, allow that to speak through you in its purest sense. You are the vessel, we are the vessels and act like it. You know, it's kind of like Morehouse. Morehouse tells the men, I'm an honorary, I'm, I didn't graduate from Morehouse, I was inducted into the International Collegium of Scholars. And so Morehouse's philosophy is they place a crown above your head and you have to grow tall enough to wear it. The crown is there. I still have some growing to do. So similarly so with these various traditions, be it the Greek tradition, be it the Rosicrucian, the, the Masonic tradition, the theosophical tradition, all of them in their purest sense, they place a crown above your head and ask you, dare you to grow into it. Do you grow into it or do you choose to just walk away from it? I'm choosing to grow into it. I'm not there yet. Maybe one day when we're old and gray, grayer, <laughs> Michael, maybe I'll grow into it, but I'm still working to grow into it. 